Hey everybody, this is Brother Frank with the Remnant Call saying hello to everybody and praise God. We are still alive. God is still on the throne. And uh, folks, let not your hearts be troubled, but let your heart be intentional intentionally focused upon our Lord in this hour, because you can see it, our society is degrading at lightning speed. And folks, we need to be about our Heavenly Father's business. I'm going to jump right into prayer because this message is important. Father, in Yeshua's name, we thank you so much for this Hanukkah season that we are in right now, Lord, knowing that the word Hanukkah means to dedicate. And Lord, we know that in John chapter 10, when Yeshua was in the in the temple during the Feast of Dedication, Lord, it, continuing after that few verses later, you said that the Lord had sanctified Yeshua. And Lord, looking in that word in the, in the original language, in the Greek says, dedicate. And we, Lord, we know that that equivalent in Hebrew is Hanukkah. Oh Lord, may we Hanukkah ourselves to you, Lord. Dedicate ourselves, Lord. Just like back in the Maccabean revolt, Lord, when they when they took back and they rededicated that that temple, Lord, that had been desecrated with pig's blood on the altar and the wickedness from Antiochus Epiphanes, Lord, when they rededicated it, Lord, also we have defiled our hearts so often, Lord, in our temples, which, Lord, our bodies are a temple unto the Holy Ghost, Lord, as, as the Word of God says. And, Lord, we need to rededicate that to you. I pray this program, Lord, would be an eye opener to the believers listening. And for Lord, those who are on the fence in their walk with you, Lord, may this be a program of reckoning to cause them, he or she, to come to a decision that they will follow you. Is my prayer in Yeshua's name. Amen. Folks, judgment is coming. It's coming whether you like it or not. It's coming. It's already here on America. You can see the degradation of our society, the filth, the disgustingness that's going on, the absolute corruption, the things that are going on that were once we were held up as a nation with integrity. And now you can see that our integrity is lost because we no longer follow the rule of law. And folks, let me tell you what, we are saved by faith, but God's law, his commandments are a blessing and keep the world safe. They keep our neighbors safe when you don't steal and you don't covet. They are a blessing to others. And when society goes lawless, that is is the spirit of Antichrist. And the spirit of Antichrist is here. And the reason it is here and alive and so prevalent at this moment is because judgment is coming, not only on the United States, but it's coming on the whole world. And there will come a day of reckoning. And if you haven't made your decision, folks, let me just remind you, there will come a day when every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And that judgment day that is coming, the great white throne judgment, I'm telling you, you want to make sure that you are hidden and clothed in Yeshua's robe of righteousness. Because if you think that you can get in your own robe, if you think you can get in in your own clothing, well, you got another thing coming. Because you can't earn it. But don't ever be deceived in thinking just because you can't earn it that God doesn't expect us to live in his ways and follow his guidance. This is an hour when you need to make a decision because judgment is coming. Some years ago, I think it was back in 2017, I shared possibly one of the most powerful speeches ever delivered in the U.S. history. Just a couple little tiny paragraphs here. 
and I was looking at it again, and I wanted to share it with you tonight because I think it is a reminder of the very hour that we are in right now. And it was held in the St. John's Church in Richmond, Virginia, in March 20th, 1775. As the Revolutionary War was beginning, Delicate Henry stood before the Second Virginia Convention and spoke. And I'll tell you, folks, I live in Virginia. I wish we were the old Virginia, because this new Virginia, I'm ashamed of and embarrassed because of the fall that the leaders of this state have taken in their false uh, gospel and their false, the governor of this state, who is a, is a lover of abortion and death even after the birth of the baby. It's disgusting. But back in 1775, Delegate Henry stood up, and this is what he had to say in front of the Virginia Convention. They tell us, sir, that we are weak unable to cope with so formidable an adversary. But when shall we be stronger? Will it be next week or next year? Will it be when we are totally disarmed and when a British guard shall be stationed in every house? Shall we gather strength by irresolution and inaction? Shall we acquire the means of effectual resistance by lying supinely on our backs and hugging the delusive phantom of hope until our enemies shall have bound us hand and foot? It is in vain, sir, to extenuate the matter. Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war is actually begun. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? This is that gentleman wish. What would they have? Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Powerful, powerful words spoken by Patrick Henry. Today, right now, just as in the days of Patrick Henry, perhaps even worse, I would say, We are faced with an attack from the enemy that has not only this world in absolute confusion and disarray, but the church of God to the outside world appears almost defeated to many as we fight and squabble and remain silent as absolute tragedies and rampant sin and abuse happens all around us. Today's battle is unlike anything we've ever seen. The attacks are coming from all directions. People who have been faithful for many years are suffering untold trials, sickness, cancer, COVID, pain, rifled bodies of so many ailments, all affecting even the believers of the Most High. Financial burdens, loss of loved ones, and brethren, and so many are sitting Uh, even listening right now to this program, worried about some problem going on somewhere in their life that they can barely even worship God anymore. Children are in rebellion. Suicide rates are through the roof right now. Confusion runs rampant, not only in the world, but in the very children, not knowing what gender they are in this hour. Schools and teachers have gotten lazy because their children are at home teaching such fables that the children came from monkeys and that they can be whatever gender they decide to be. It's your choice and explore sexual exploits that are saved for marriage, even in second and third and fourth grade. We are living in such a time as moral depravity as at the all-time high, yet people are only concerned about our election. I'm telling you, the society has completely fallen in the United States of America. And just when it couldn't gotten any worse, the plethora of disorders from technology addiction, pornography, and social uh, media addiction is killing the body of Jesus Christ in this hour. 
Some of you listening right now feel so beaten down, you have lost your fight and you are almost ready to throw in the towel because Donald Trump may not win the election or because this plan and that plan has not going to the, according to the way that you have been praying for. And so here we are in December of 2020. We have had everything thrown at us. The governor in Virginia is telling us that we have to wear masks inside of our home if we have a few people over. They are telling us how we can worship our God. They are telling us how we can meet and who what we can do. They are trying to tell us and make us conform to their great society for their great coming reset, for their liberal agenda of a so-called utopia, which does not include Christians. This is the hour that we are living in. And instead of us standing up and being the body of believers that we are called to be, we are cowering in fear and we are so afraid to do anything because we might offend somebody in this hour. And I am wondering where the church of Jesus Christ is at this moment because they are relatively silent except for those who sit behind their keyboards on their computers yet don't have the courage to share the gospel with somebody in their lives to bring them hope in Jesus Christ. If you think all you could do is just sit back and listen to programs and never share with anybody, I don't know what gospel you have ever been reading in the Bible. But the Lord has called us to a great commission. And so my question is, in this hour, judgment is coming, but the question is this, do you flee or do you fight? I'm telling you what, it's time to fight. Turn with me if you have your Bibles a second Kings chapter 18, and we're going to read a little bit of scripture tonight. I hope that's okay. We're going to explore some of the word of God because it's um, crazy how people are are praying and asking God to speak and how wanting God to, to show them something and, and wanting God to give them some kind of revelation, yet not spending any time reading the word of God. I don't understand it. It makes no sense. If you think you can get everything by just a word of knowledge without spending time in the Bible, you've lost your mind. Because God wants us to read his word. 2 Kings chapter 18. You remember the young, passionate, on fire for the Lord, age 25, King Hezekiah had began his righteous reign in Judah. Israel was a mess. The Bible said that they had sinned against the Lord, but it wasn't always so outwardly. The Bible says they did it in secret in those days. They didn't want everyone to see what was really going on. They had set up images in the high places of worship. They even took the bronze serpent that Moses had made in the wilderness, and they began to worship it. And here comes the king, 25 years old, King Hezekiah, on fire for the Lord. And he tears down the high places and he destroys the images that the people had set up and he destroyed the bronze serpent because it was causing the people to stumble. And in 2 Kings chapter 18 and verse 5, this is what it says. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. You see, King Hezekiah had restored back worship to the temple where it should be. Things were going well in Israel once again. But we all know that good things don't always seem to last forever, do they? Just six years into the reign of King Hezekiah, we saw Samaria, Israel's northern kingdom, captured by the king of Assyria. But Judah, the southern kingdom, was safe and was doing well until 14 years into the reign of King Hezekiah. Look what it says, starting in verse 13. Now in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against all the fenced cities of Judah and took them. And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria, to Lachish, saying, I have offended. Return from me. That which thou puttest on me will I bear. And the king of Assyria appointed unto Hezekiah, 
king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30, 30 talents of gold. And Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the, the treasures of the king's house. And that time did Hezekiah cut off the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the pillars which Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and, t- and gave it to the king of Assyria. So here, Hezekiah had enjoyed the protection of the Lord. But when all of a sudden he was really being threatened, he tried to appease the king of Assyria by giving him the silver out of God's house and tearing off the gold from the pillars of the temple of the Lord that he had put up, thinking that he could somehow appease the devil. And folks, I want to tell you right now, you can never appease the devil by sacrificing the holy things of God. No matter what you do, you will never appease the enemy. There is not enough gold, silver, or things you can do, and we definitely cannot sacrifice the holy things of God. Well, as we will see, that didn't last. Verse 18, And when they had called the king, there came out to them Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, which was over the household of Shebna and the scribe and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, and Rabshakeh said to them, Speak ye now to Hezekiah, thus saith the king, the king of Assyria. What confidence is this wherein thou trustest? Thou sayest, but they are but vain words. I have counsel and strength for the war. Now on whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? Now, behold, thou trustest upon the staff of this bruised reed, even upon Egypt, of which if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh king of Egypt unto all them who trust him. But if you say unto me, we trust in the Lord our God, is not that he which high place and whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away and hath said unto Judah the Jerusalem, ye shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem? Do you see the head game? The Rabshak is playing on God's people. How dare you trust in the king, the Pharaoh to help you? Or how dare you trust in the Lord God? You see what Hezekiah did? He tore down your high places, the places where you were used to worship God, which were the false places of worship. They were not the true ways to worship God, which ended up bringing even more false worship into these high places. And yet he's trying to tell them, no, those were the true places. And Hezekiah tore them down. And he's trying to play a mind game on God's people. And folks, I'm trying to tell you right now, many times what we thought were the right ways to worship God were actually the high places. And God ends up tearing them down in our lives. And what do we do? We try to run back to them because we somehow thought, well, if we could just go back to the way church used to be, maybe everything would be all right. Well, maybe it wasn't right to begin with. Maybe the way church used to be was not right. Maybe sitting in a pew week after week and hearing a sermon and never going out and actually sharing the gospel, maybe God got tired of it and dispatched you to go into this world and share the living hope of Jesus Christ. But no, we think we got to go back into Egypt, go back to the high places. And the devil, Rabshak, he's just trying to tell the people how bad Hezekiah was. Verse 28, then Rabshake stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language and spake, saying, Hear the word of the king, the great king of Assyria. Thus saith the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you you out of his hand. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, the Lord will surely deliver us, and this city shall not be delivered into the hand of of Assyria. Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered out of his land, out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arphad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim and Hena and Iva? Have they delivered Samaria out of mine hand? Who are they among all the gods of the countries that have delivered their country out of mine hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? And here he's trying to say, who do you think your God is that he can deliver you? Who do you think, has any other God delivered these countries out of the hand of the king of Assyria? No, and you think Yahweh can do it? 
You see, folks, we somehow forget. We start out so often on our journey on fire for the Lord. We see his deliverance, but something tends to happen over time. We forget the one we serve. And here comes the devil into our lives. Where's God? He doesn't care about you. He hasn't answered your prayers. He has, where is he at? He, he, he hasn't delivered you from anything. Look at your sufferings. Folks, that's the, from the pit of hell. It's been tried all through history over and over again. And it's being done to God's people right now. And that's what Rabshakeh was trying to do as he was speaking to him in their native tongue. Oh yes, he will come to you. The devil likes to talk to you in the native language that you love to hear. The things that soothe your soul, that make you feel good and comfortable. So they bring the word to the king and he's deeply disturbed at what is being said. The words of Rabshakeh. Listen to what the king said. Listen to what they say. And they said unto him, Thus saith Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble and of rebuke and of blasphemy. For the children are come to birth and there is not strength to bring forth. Hezekiah is sitting here talking. He's like, listen, this is a horrible day. We're like a woman in birth pains. The baby's coming due and we don't even have the strength to push. And folks, if a woman can't push, that could kill her. He's saying it's like we are going to die in the middle of our birthing pains. It may be the Lord thy God will hear all the words of Rabshakeh, whom the king of Assyria, his master, hath sent to reproach the living God and will reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. Wherefore, lift up the, thy prayer for the remnant that are left. So here in a moment of weakness, Hezekiah begins to get scared. What if God doesn't hear our prayers? What if he listens to Rabshakeh? What if he hears all of his words and forgets about us? But praise God. Word got to Isaiah, the prophet, of what was going on. And when Isaiah heard, he sends back a word to the king. This is what he, to not be worried. Because God will cause the king of Assyria to hear a rumor and return unto his own land, and he will fall by the sword. There's nothing to worry about, Hezekiah. Right? I mean, wouldn't that be enough, Isaiah the prophet? There's nothing to worry about. So Rabshakeh returns and finds the king of Assyria at war. And here's the king of Ethiopia is also coming up to fight and immediately sends word back to Hezekiah and listen to what he says. So he goes home. The words of Isaiah the prophet are true, but he, he sees what's going on. So he sends back a word to Hezekiah. And this is what he says. Behold, thou hast heard that the king of Assyria hath done to all the lands by destroying them utterly. And thou shalt be delivered. Half the gods of the nations delivered them which thy fathers have destroyed as Gozan and Herod. Aaron and Resef and the children of Eden and they were Theazar, wherein the king of Hamath and the king of Arphad and the king of the city of Sepharvaim and Hena and Iva. So here Hezekiah, he is back to where he started. So he, a moment of weakness, God sends a powerful word to don't worry by Isaiah the prophet. You don't got to worry. I'm sending a rumor. He's going back. He's going to fall by his own sword. Everything's going well, right? But as soon as Rabshakeh he sees what's going on, he sends a word back. And right after the very word that Isaiah says, and there's confidence restored, here Hezekiah begins to falter again. He's right back to where he started. He tried to pay off the king of Assyria, but that wasn't good enough. He had taken the gold off the temple's door. That wasn't good enough. He had heard the word of the Lord from Isaiah, but, that, but he was still troubled. You see, folks, when your life starts out with compromise, when you, believe, when you begin to compromise in order to satisfy the devil in your walk with God, things are never stable anymore. You see, the truth is today, we got a bunch of believers who like to wear their Jesus t-shirts. But at the moment that God calls us to action, we don't know who the Lord is. 
We like to have our bumper stickers. We like to tell people we're part of the remnant. We like to talk about the end times. But when God actually calls us to stand up for truth, we hardly can even be found. You see, you cannot appease the devil with compromise. But instead, we fight him with the truth by not sacrificing the holy things of God. But God doesn't give up on believers. And he didn't give up on Hezekiah. And this time when Hezekiah received that word back from Rabshakeh, he, he did what he knew to do. He returned to the things of when he was growing up that he was taught and he remembered who the Lord was. And look what happens in verse 14 when he received that word back about the things that Rabshakeh had said. He says this, verse 14, and Hezekiah received the letter of the hand of the messenger and read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord. And the Lord God of Israel, which dwellest between the cherubims, thou art God, even thou alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. Sometimes, folks, when we turn back to God, the first thing we need to do is recognize his holiness of who he is, which Hezekiah is doing, the one who dwells above the cherubims. In verse 16, Lord, Bow down thy ear and hear, open, Lord, thine eye and see and hear the words of Sennacherib, which hath sent him to reproach the living God. Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have destroyed the nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were no gods but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they have destroyed them. Now, therefore, O Lord, our God, I beseech thee, Save thou us out of his hand, thou all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord God, even thou only. So Hezekiah, in the midst of his trouble, remembers that when it's down, when you forget, when you get off the path, you do what you knew to do. You come back to God. And folks, I don't care how far you've messed up, how much you've gotten backslidden, how many wrong turns you've taken. If you come back to the Lord right now, you will find him right where you left him. And when he does this, he brings it to him and he cries out and, he's, and he pleads with the Lord and he lays his case out before God. God gets Isaiah the prophet up and he sums this up by sending another powerful word through Isaiah in 2 Kings chapter 19 and verse 32. This is what he says. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor cast a bank against it. By the way that he came in, by the same shall he return and shall not come into this city, saith the Lord, for I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred, fourscore, and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. God was ready to fight. At the moment, Hezekiah cried out unto him. You see, folks, I know right now so many of you are wondering, where is God? I get the emails, your family, sick, surgeries, uh, all these kind of things going on, and you're beginning to question if your faith, because you maybe haven't seen the healings yet that you've been praying for, and you're wondering, where is God in this hour? You've been beaten down and you have known the truth in God's word, but for some reason, Rabshakeh and the king of Assyria have been telling you God can't deliver. You've tried to pray, but sometimes you feel an ounce of deliverance. It seems like the messenger of Satan comes right back and steals that little bit of deliverance away. And now you feel more violently attacked than before you even started to pray to the point where you don't even want to pray for others because you're afraid you might be attacked even more. And if God really loves you, why haven't you had a victory yet? It's all lies from the devil. And it's in that moment when the truth of God 
that you have known many of you since you were children. And that word comes from the Lord that says God will fight for you. He will protect you. He has not forgotten you. He has not left you. And it is at that moment when we remember those things that God can fight for us. And he will fight for us when we remember to bring the fight back to his throne. And that starts by getting back into our prayer closets. It's time for us to fight as believers. And when we fight, God fights. Because our fight is when we bring it before his throne. You see, folks, when we get back into the prayer closet, when we begin to turn the world down again, when we begin to seek God in earnest and and continued prayer and studying his word is when things will begin to change. Because honestly, if you're struggling, if you're really struggling right now and you will take an honest inventory on your life and look at your prayer life and look at your Bible study and look at your what you're focused on and can you honestly say to yourself that I'm reading God's word, I'm focusing upon him, I'm, do, I'm praying like I should and everything is going wrong? I doubt it. Because when you are praying like you should and we are seeking the Lord with all of our heart and even when things are not going right, it's at those minutes we say, you know what, God, even though it's not going right, I love you and I trust you anyways. Because in this world, Lord, you never promised me a rose garden. You did promise to never leave me nor forsake me. And folks, it is in those times of seeking God that his peace will begin to flow back over us again when we remember the powerful promise promises that he said in his word for those that are struggling to stay straight on God's path. You got to remember what he said in Isaiah 45 verse two. He says, I will go before you and make the crooked path straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. See, it's in the prayer closet that we claim these promises. And we say, God, you said that you would go before me and you would make the crooked path straight again, Lord. I cannot do it in myself. I have listened to the king of Assyria. I've listened to the words of Rabshakeh too often. Lord, I've messed it up, but I'm coming back tonight and I'm claiming what you've said, Lord, in your word that you would straighten these crooked ways out. He says in Isaiah 52, verse 12, for you shall not go out with haste nor go by flight for the Lord will go before you and God of Israel will be your rear guard. Lord, you promised in your word that you would not only be in front of me, but you would be behind me to protect me from the enemy. And we claim those promises and we remember that it is God who started it and it is he who will finish it. And it is in this hour that he's reminding us, just like when Hezekiah got off the path, it's time to come back to the the Lord again. Therefore, understand today the Lord your God is he who goes before you as a consuming fire. He will destroy them and bring them down before you, so you shall drive them out and destroy them quickly, as the Lord has said to you. Deuteronomy chapter 9 and verse 3. In Exodus 14, 14, it says this, the Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. We talked about that last week. It's time to remember, folks, once again, that we need to hold our peace at times. Stop the complaining. Begin to prayer and sit back and start seeing the salvation of your God come to pass. God says in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 25, for I will contend with him who contends with you. God says, don't you worry about vengeance. Don't you worry about who's doing you wrong. I will take care of that person. You might not see it right now, believer. You might not see it in the next few minutes, but God will deal with them. He will deal with them because he is the one who will fight for you. Folks, judgment is coming. It is coming on America. It's coming on believers. It will all end here on this earth one day, coming very soon. But God is calling us in this hour to remember our mission, and that is to share the gospel with a dying world. Get up out of your seats, believers. Stop only listening to YouTube. Stop only listening to different programs and actually get out and share the good news. Even though there's COVID out there, you can still pray, call somebody, send them a message, do something to share the good news that Jesus is coming again. If you can't get out of your house, 
you can still pray. You can still pray. Judgment is coming. Don't let your guard down now. It doesn't matter who wins the election anymore. It truly doesn't. Because this country is morally bankrupt. Because the false pillow prophets of this age promised everybody a false bill of goods that their best life was now. And that was a lie from the pit of hell. Your best life, it's coming in the future in the kingdom of the almighty. That will be your best life. But here on this earth, your mission is this and this alone to go out and to share the good news with every living creature that Jesus is coming again. This is Brother Frank on the Remnant Call reminding us to fight on our knees in our prayer closets. Not tomorrow, now. Good night and shalom. Trumpet in Zion, sounded on the mountain. The trumpet in Zion.